Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Service to the greater community is a central theme of This Is Nashville. In highlighting the people who have dedicated their lives to helping others, we, in a way, help to motivate the next generation of leaders and people dedicated to service. Perhaps no other two people represent leadership and service like my next guests. While popular culture obsesses over the relationship between Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, or Taylor Swift and that NFL football player, people here in Nashville have been singing the praises of our own power couple, Dr. Billy Sanders and Reverend Edwin Sanders. Founders of the Metropolitan Interdenominational Church, the Sanders have been advocates for justice and equality. Their church's mantra, inclusive of all and alienating to none, is the antithesis of the segregated country they grew up in. Their work in Nashville and the state at large has impacted tens of thousands, and somehow, remarkably, they're still at it. Last week, Billy joined our panel of elders to talk about aging and ageism. So we thought we'd bring back our November interview with this power couple. I'd like to welcome Dr. Billy Sanders and Reverend Edwin Sanders to This is Nashville. Thank you both for being here. Really an honor to have you here. Well, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Okay, so how's how's life been for both of you recently? (laughs) Well, mine has been defined by a number of things. Uh, my work goes on no matter what. I, no matter where I am in in this country or in the world, uh, it's always built around dealing with ways in which, in the spirit of what I think faith institutions should be, ways in which you're responding to the dynamics of human life that sometimes leave people in compromised positions, leave people in the ranks of those who end up being the disinherited, and those who have, in one way or another, not been able to have full benefit of opportunity, as well as being seen and looked at in a way that allows you to see them as being people who have every bit of possibility in their lives as any and everyone else. So it's my my activity is, in one way or another, it always comes back to the bottom line, and that is to make sure that there is encouragement and to make sure that there is energy being invested in each and every person. In in that sense, that's where the sense of equality means a lot to us. So yeah, that's so it you know, you, you could hit any subject that has anything to do with what I do and what I'm involved in. And one way or another, it'll always come back to how you become a part of making sure that no one ends up being disenfranchised. No one ends up being left out of the circle of inclusion in terms of opportunity and the like. Yeah, Miss Billy. Lately, I would say I've been living my best life. Okay, I uh, am semi-retired. I was a partner at Waller Lance and Dorch and Davis, and I retired. And I, I, I call myself semi-retired because I do some legal work. I'm an arbitrator for AAA, but I do it on my own terms. So I am able to get up in the morning and decide what I want to do. And I'm still very involved in a lot of civic activities, involved in the church, and uh, I'm able to travel, visit my family, and it's it's just a, a sense of freedom to be able to decide how I'm going to spend my day. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of instability in our country and around the world. A lot of people believe that the fabric of our democracy is under attack. Americans, they lack trust and faith in our government. Economic turmoil and stability has kind of zapped people's let's say, belief in a secure future, the world in itself is notably in conflict, notably in Israel and Ukraine. And I have this question for you. You know, you both were young people during the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War. Do you see any relation or comparisons to the situation of those times and today? Well, yeah, I I would definitely uh, see a comparison. I mean, there's a lot of instability uh, in the world, but I guess when I look back at the world, you know, there's been a lot of stability, instability from the founding of the co- this country. I mean, even when I look at what's going on in Ukraine, I mean, that's 
how this country was founded. I mean, mm. some people were imperialists and came and you know took the country from some from the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I think we have to own up to the way this whole country, I mean, the whole world has been settled. I mean, at one time, the sun never set on the British Empire because they colonized most of the world. So um, I think we have to own up to that, and I think we have to try to do better uh, in terms of looking at what's going on in the world. And um, I think we have to understand what our responsibility was in creating this world as it is mm. understanding our responsibility what it was to create the world as it is um I, I i like that because sometimes you know as americans we have a very short memory or no memory at all because mm -hmm. we weren't taught the actual history of what happened mm -hmm. so what does that mean to grab responsibility of, of an occasion or an in, of something that happened take full ownership of it in the process of not necessarily trying to rectify it but to make things better. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's hard, you know, if you don't if you don't really know your history or you don't tell your history, you don't really understand that and you can um I think be in a in a situation where you uh, you know, think of everybody else being the enemy, but you have to look at, you know, your responsibility for what you've done and I think, you know, we as a as a country, we have a lot of power in the world and we need to use that to uh Try to, you know, make the world a more equitable place. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I want to go back to your early lives a little bit and, and understand, like, how you both got to be where you are today, what set you on that path. Uh, uh, Miss Billy, where did you grow up? I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, when I grew up there, it was uh, the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, my parents uh, protected us protected us as much as they could from the indignities of segregation and um but you know we had our own world uh that we lived in and I was surrounded by excellence my you know my parents were college educated and uh, my mother was a librarian my father was an accountant and uh we had excellent schools they were segregated schools but most of our teachers had master's degrees because black people couldn't do much of anything else but you know be a teacher be a professional a doctor a lawyer own their own small businesses because we couldn't go to the white businesses so there were a lot of small business owners and we lived all you know in the same communities because there was no, you know there was not um housing was not integrated so people saw people you know move up and, and and everybody was living together you know whether you were in poverty or you know you were a professional you all lived in similar neighborhoods and so uh, we had social activities and um and in my church that i went to you know the, a lot of my teachers that were at my school went to my church so i was surrounded by excellence at church uh so uh, I, I had a very, uh, a very happy childhood. I mean, I knew it was, you know, about segregation. Uh, and, you know, I wondered why people treated us like this, you know. Mm -hmm. But my parents always said, you know, we were, you know, as, as good as anybody and we could become whatever we wanted to be. We would probably have to work twice as hard uh, to get half as much as our white counterparts got. But, you know, we, we, could, we could work and, 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 and overcome it. You said your mother was a librarian. Did she really instill a love of reading in you? Yes, she did. You know, we could always get as many library books as we wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, she did. In fact, she was uh, she was an English major in college, and she made us put a penny in a jar any time that we would speak broken English or you know. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so she was she was a real stickler. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 Reverend Ed, where'd you grow up? Actually, uh, I grew up, I always say, all around the Central South. Uh, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, but when I was 18 months old, <clears throat> my father was a Methodist minister, a Methodist minister in what is now referred to as the old central jurisdiction of the Methodist Church. When we hear a lot these days about United Methodism, and of course, there's also the other AME and CME churches that are part of Methodism. But my father was a part of the Methodist church that was primarily the segregated wing of the Methodist church. Mm. So the central jurisdiction 
is the way in which they define the congregations that were a part of uh, African ancestry primarily. Um, I think that's, that's really probably a good way to put it. There were some indigenous peoples in various places, like, for instance, when you went a little bit to the West, when you went to, especially to Oklahoma. Uh, my father was a very um, much involved in the way in which the administration of the central jurisdiction was carried out. He was one of the persons who worked under Bishop Matthew W. Clare, who is a stellar name in uh, Methodism within the you know within the African American communities, so but admit that um, he served congregations everywhere from Tennessee to Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, especially up to um, up to oh well, yeah I guess probably up to Oklahoma. So that circle, there were some other central jurisdiction churches in other parts of the country. In the North, in, in some instances, I always laugh when I say in the North, though I should say, in some of the cities that I, 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 don't, I don't quote Malcolm X often, but one of, the, one of the quotations from Malcolm that I always appreciate is uh, people talk about down South. I remember one of his talks, he said, uh, everything South of the Canadian border. Mm. Is is the South? It's uh-huh. just a matter of whether you're up South or down South. Yes. And I must admit, I learned that to be the case more and more as I grew and matured and traveled and became involved in communities, not just in the South. But uh, my experience is very much like the experience that my wife was just uh, reflecting in talking about the communities she grew up in and the kinds of things that probably facilitated a sense of having uh, a real opportunity for possibility, irrespective of what might be the negatives Mm. that sometimes were all around us. Uh, Interestingly enough, both of our mothers were librarians, so uh, we both probably spent a lot of time uh, being probably uh, guided in the direction of appreciation for reading, writing, and the ways in which we used language you, as a vehicle that would help us. I can imagine neither one of you ever turned in a library book late. Oh, well. Well, I can't say that. <laughs> so, I can't say that. <laughs> sometimes I did take advantage of the relationship yes. to a head librarian. <laughs> but, I understand but, that. Uh, no, but it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a wonderful life experience. I always tell people. My, my, my birth father actually died when I was 11 years old. But in that time, uh, it's as though he had some sense of foretelling and knowing that his life would not be long. Mm. And he was really very much determined that I would have as great an exposure to every opportunity that you could imagine. From what you just described of him, it seems like his purpose became yours. Yes, very much. And so so how did... did those formative years of your life, traveling yes. to different parts of the central right. south, yes. you would say. How did that really, how did that experience help you and guide you on your path and really develop your thoughts about equality and mm-hmm. you know influence you to fight for it? I think that um, I was able to see my father be directly involved and my mother directly involved in tearing down the walls of division and segregation. But they did it in ways that were very much a part of that which was the byproduct of the way in which they were uh, individually a part of making sure that opportunities were always available to us. Uh, There are ways in which they always were, as Billy said, very beautifully just making sure that our capacity in terms of ability to be a part of communicating effectively in any arena that we found ourselves ended up being very important. I uh, I always laugh about it because I did leave the South and go to New England to uh, school as an undergrad. And uh, I always tell 
people that's interesting. When I'm up north, people say you sound like you're from the south. When I'm in the south, people say I sound like I'm from the north. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so there's a way in which I guess I have been always aware of and conscious of making sure that I was not one who could be easily undermined in terms of opportunity on the basis of the way in which I articulated, I spoke, and I dealt with whatever was before me at any given time. Yeah. I, 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 I want to talk about that a little bit more, about communication. Sure. Because today, 2023, people have, I, I'd say there's two schools with this. Some folks talk with jargon and terms of social justice, of freedom. There's a lot of words that we hear. I, I, I hear the term DEI every day. I hear inclusion every day, but mm -hmm. not necessarily, I, I don't necessarily know if I believe it when people use those words. And then mm -hmm. folks are trying to speak and communicate freely in a way that's easy for people to understand, where you kind of understand mm -hmm. not only my intent and intention, but my meaning behind this. Yes. And uh, we have a we live in a world where we have these computers on our in our pockets, phones, social media. We're inundated with messages, messages over and over again. It almost feels like there's a corporate speak to social justice these days. How I, I'd like to get your reflections on this. You all have been fighting for freedom and equality for decades now. You've been leading the town and the city and people. Um, where do you see? the way we communicate with each other. Do you see it now as a thing that's really, really benefiting us or are there, there are areas where we, we can improve upon? I'd love to hear from both of you. Well, I think there are definitely areas that we can improve upon, but I think we have so many information sources. It's hard to really, I think a lot of people never really get in depth in anything because you know if you're on social media and you're reading newspapers, you're listening to various communication sources, you might not really get in depth and and it's also hard to tell what is true and what's not these days the way we communicate i i mean i was a journalist before i was a lawyer and um i mean sometimes it, it, it just upsets me <laughs> the way i see stories reported in the newspaper and young people don't even read, read the newspaper anymore. I know mm -hmm. a lot of times they get their information off of so, social media so i guess i'm challenged in terms of really uh, people being able to identify really what's the truth and, and being critical thinkers. You know, even if you get a piece of information, okay, what do you do with that? Do you just believe it or do you, do you try to figure out how to do a little more research so that you can verify uh, what you've just heard? And I think, you know, that's, that's something uh, that's needed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think we had very few information sources, you know, when I was growing up. And some of those weren't necessarily telling the truth or they were leaving a lot out. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always been a challenge to be a critical thinker. And so I think that's why it's so important to read books, you know, where there's been more in-depth knowledge, uh, more in-depth research about a particular subject. And I guess I'm a big audio listener, and that way I can read books while I'm driving in the car or I can be walking or just multitasking. And I just encourage people to be more critical about uh, what they absorb from news sources mm -hmm. and, and, and try to get more in-depth in knowledge mm -hmm. because it's hard to just communicate a real concept in a soundbite. And, you know, you mentioned diversity and inclusion. I think, you know, a lot of people have programs, a lot of corporations have programs, and, you know, they're just, and, you know, some of them are sincere about it, but I think many... Um, uh, maybe are just kind of doing what they think is right, or or what their clients want. Because most of, you know most corporations are driven by their customers or their clients, mm -hmm. and so if they're demanding that you do this, then they may do it. But you know the the real issue is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you know first it was diversity, then they added inclusion, and I think inclusion is supposed to mean that you not just have diverse people in your organization, but you make them really a part of decision making and and leadership and 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 the culture, and you also listen to their ideas that may be different than what was um, the typical uh, scenario in a particular organization. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, Reverend Ed. You know, people are want to engage in conversation, and some folks may be afraid to really express how they feel about a particular political issue or moral issue because they may be castigated from the group in their community that they have. 
How can people find the bravery to speak their own truth, but also find the empathy to not hurt others while expressing that truth? I think one of the great opportunities that's been afforded me in terms of professionally being able to address audiences that for one reason or another will find themselves looking to you as being a person that maybe can have a a posture that suggests to others that they can be trusted, Mm -hmm. that they're hearing a trustworthy expression when they're talking. Uh, One of the things I've done around many of the crisis issues that could begin with the whole soul force movement, uh, known by many as the civil rights movement, but I I've always tried to get people to appreciate that Dr. King even was one who really did not like the idea of civil rights. He liked to say soul force Mm. because so much of what we think of when we say civil rights ends up being driven by the ways in which we think about the things that are the byproduct of government and statehood and and community global, you know, the ways in which uh, the, the history has been so impacted and distorted by those who were really exploitation, well, uh, Mm -hmm. exploitation-driven. One of the things that happens when you, uh, I I laugh about this often, because uh, people, when they hear you, see you, and know that you're involved in a wide range of things around questions and, and about where we are today in terms of societal issues, one of the things that I've discovered in my own life is that um, I feel like I always have to be ready, prepared, and willing to respond to questions because people will, if you're in situations where people see you in a role that would represent a way in which they can get to another level of understanding of what's going on in the world today, especially when you think about the division, the conflict, the ways in which there has continued to be dynamics that define people in a way that probably ends up separating more than including. But one of the things that happens with me, I kind of smile as I say it to you, I've gotten to where I know very often that people, even in a moment's notice, will put you on the spot Mm -hmm. and say, well, what do you think about this? So consequently, I probably have some things that I talk about that uh, probably I repeat in various contexts, but there are certain issues that drive almost any context we find ourselves in, in terms of issues of race and class and that kind of thing. But I was going to say to you that um, <laughs> there's a there's a message. I'm probably guilty as probably most folk who do a lot of the work, the, the kind of work that I do. You have a theme that you get stuck on, and I've been stuck on the theme of myths, lies, and misrepresentations of the truth. Uh, I have found it interesting the way in which I could be in a lot of different contexts. I could be in contexts where we're talking about health issues. I could be in contexts where we're talking about economic opportunity. It could be a context where we're talking about education. I mean, you could run down the list of things that should be a part of the fabric of human life in a way that allows people to fulfill their potentials. So, but I have discovered that I don't like to think of having uh, these divisions in the ways in which our experiences of life gets played out when really there are common factors that end up being impactful for all of us. Mm. My, my, my wife, we, we have a little thing we say all the time where we say, I do God's law, she does man's law. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's all a matter at some point of dealing with trying to examine and find your way to addressing what is the truth. Mm. And uh, as she was saying a minute ago, I'm, I'm amazed by the way in which that which represents less than the truth has made itself into hierarchical spaces where people that you would think would be above it, beyond it, and not get driven by it ends up being so different. I, I, I don't think anybody could have told me Uh, when I was in my earliest academic formative years that we'd ever be at a place where the highest offices in this country, you know, like the Supreme Court or like perhaps, you know, the the presidents and the like. The whole idea, not that there probably haven't been some shades of that or dimensions of that throughout the history of this country. The fact is uh, myths 
lies and misrepresentations of the truth are so woven into the fabric of our everyday reality that um, it happens and in literally commonplace kind of ways. Mm -hmm. I do want to talk about that a little bit more, but now let's take a short break. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. My guests are Dr. Billy Sanders and her husband, Reverend Edwin Sanders. They're the founders of the Metropolitan Interdenominational Church, and they've lived lives of service to benefit not only Nashvillians, but everyone, really. Before the break, we learned a little bit about their early lives, and we're going to get back to that conversation. Dr. Billy, Reverend Ed, thank you so much for being here with us today. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Really a pleasure to have you both here. Now, you were talking, Reverend Ed, about myths lies and misrepresentation and how that applies to the our country now and kind of our lives and we're trying to figure things out as we work through you know creating a more just society i would say i'm interested in like the work that you both did when you were younger now miss billy you attended fisk university and you ended up studying law after that you did something kind of unprecedented. You became the first woman in Nashville history to be in-house counsel for a Nashville bank, breaking barriers, breaking ground back then. What did that mean to you at that time to have such an impact? Well, I mean, it was, you know, it was significant, but I mean, it really came from, you know, working hard in relationships. I mean, I, um, I was working. I, I took a, a chance of, to pull a sign off the bulletin board at the law school where someone was look, looking for a job, and it was at Woods and Woods, uh, which is a small Nashville firm. And I went to work there as a law clerk. Uh, and you know, of course, I, I was their first African American clerk, and um, you know, I had a great relationship with the attorneys there. And one of the uh, partners in the firm. Uh, Frank Woods became um, the president of United American Bank, and I was still doing work for the bank as a law clerk and so forth. And about the time I was graduating, you know, I was applying to other places, Attorney General's office, all this kind of stuff. And he said, "I I really want my own lawyer at the bank." He said, "I'm mm -hmm. tired of calling the firm and everybody's at court. I want my own lawyer in the bank. Are you interested in being my in-house counsel?" Well. I said, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's how it happened. And I think a lot of times it's, you know, developing relationships with people. And you you don't know where you know, your opportunity is going to come from. But, I, you know, I think the thing is to be prepared. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I think it's important to prepare yourself so that when opportunity does come, then you're able to, to walk through that door. And so... Now you both were married at the time, right? But you were kind of newly were married. Yeah, we were. Yeah, we were. We were married. In we fact, married. we got married during my first year of law, law school. school. Yeah, yeah, over Christmas break. <laughs> over Christmas break. Well, how how did you two meet? Well, we met at Fisk University. Uh, at that time, I was a student, and uh, Reverend Ed was a uh, was assistant academic dean at Fisk University, and it wasn't really. Uh, you know, student, you know, faculty, and he was teaching. He was also uh, they, a professor. People have something to say about yeah, that today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even then, I mean, certainly yeah. then, I mean, yes. you, that wasn't kind of students and faculty didn't fraternize in that way. And uh, but he was, he was very, he was quite a gentleman about it. I mean, he said he watched me for over a year, and I'll let him tell you what he said when he first saw me. But <laughs> I, I would love to hear. That. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know it was, uh, of course. If, whenever you're talking to me, you'll find out, you know, in one way or another, Khalil, I will uh, 
weave my spirituality into it. So I will say there was something about the moment that said to me that uh, that young lady is going to be your wife one day. But at that point, I had only been at Fisk for, it was really a part of my first year when I first recognized her. She was actually a member of uh, the choir, the Black Mass Choir. And uh, the chapel was the first place where I saw her. Mm. And just instantly the light went on and said, this is somebody you know. But I was very clear about the fact that uh, it was probably going to have to, I had to rely on something of a natural uh, flow and consequence that would bring me to the point of meeting her. And she had a, a, at one point, this was after my uh, first full year there, uh, it turned out that uh, she had an issue, which was really a minor issue. Uh, I, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say I probably made it more of a ma- major issue than it was. Okay. But it was just something that needed to be resolved, which I had the ability and the authority to deal with in the dean's office. But um, it was in that context that uh, I always tell her that I knew her for a year before she knew me. <laughs> right, right. But in that year, I did try to make sure that I you know, didn't compromise any more than probably I thought I had to. I, I, I remember going to the, to the president's uh, office, who was, of course, my superior, and, uh, and I mentioned to him that there was a young lady that I thought at some point I might uh, desire to approach in terms of a, a more light, well, just a, a more uh, personal kind of, of way. And uh, and I remember so vividly the conversation. He looked at me and so said, he, he had a wonderful way of talking. Uh, he, he said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I'm sure. But let me just fast forward because that story has so many parts to it. It could go on for a while. But I will tell you what was most interesting over time, uh, I didn't know. And he did not say that he knew at the point that I first was asking him about having permission to pursue a relationship with this young lady. I did not know that the president, who was my superior, <laughs> was a childhood friend of her mother's. Oh, wow. And it grew up across the street from where they lived in Louisville, Kentucky. You know? Okay. So he had a real reason for saying, look, you know, this is. <laughs> tread, tread carefully. Yeah, tread, tread carefully. <laughs> you know, so. Um, but it, it all, it all, in the final analysis, worked out pretty, you know, very well. And uh, uh, fast forward again for graduation. Uh, I her graduation, I pretty much I proposed, and and uh, we were engaged, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and it's really interesting to this day, though, that. Uh, uh, her fritz. I always like to get the record real straight and tell folks, especially since with time, I have grown, I think, to look older, and she's grown to look younger. So <laughs> it's really only five years different today. age. I was very young when I came to Fisk to be the assistant academic dean. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> it turned out that uh, today I laugh about it because uh, she's getting ready to celebrate. Uh, I don't guess she minds me telling you the Right? No. I'm okay. Sure so, right. so, so you can say my <coughs> reunion. Yeah, that's Yeah, fine. she's getting ready to celebrate <laughs> her 50th reunion. Okay. Which means that you add a couple, few months to that, we'll be, we'll be married 50 years. Congratulations. Not long from that. Yeah, in December of, <clears throat> of 2024. Four. Congratulations. So, but one of the things that I laugh about and I still find very humorous is that uh, all of her classmates and people that were a part of that generation when she was there, all of them refer to her as De- Denise. I refer to her as Billy. But all of her friends will call me to this day Dean Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, you don't have to call him that. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> so, I love that. Funny. Okay, so you're, the, you're a newly married couple. Right, you're right. firmly on your paths of service and dedication to right. equality and justice. How are you both able to balance, you know, being a family, being newly married with the pursuit of your purpose. People have yes. a tough time with that these days. 
Well, mm-hmm. it was challenging. When we got married, I said I didn't want to have <clears throat> children. Me, Edwin had a son by a previous marriage, but I, I said I didn't want us to have children um, until I had actually practiced for at least five years because I wanted to get my uh, my career established, and I knew that I would probably want to take some time off, and I didn't want to be uh, a baby lawyer, you know, five years out. Mm-hmm. So uh, we did that, and, you know, I've worked at the bank, and um, then um, I guess, yeah, we did have our first child while I was with the bank, but um, I guess... Yeah. Shortly thereafter, yeah. the bank was purchased by another company, so I was no longer with them. And I took some time off. And then I went to the um, Public Service Commission. And at that time, there was a woman who was um, going off for maternity leave. And the general counsel there said, would you come and work while she's off for maternity leave? And I did that for three days a week, which was great. Uh while I did that, and then when she came back, she said, well, I, I, Billy, I really don't want to, you know, stay. I don't want to work full time. Would you consider uh, developing a proposal with me to, for us to share a job? And we did that. Unprecedented. State government, you know, allowed us to share a job. And I worked one, two and a half days a week. She worked two and a half. On Wednesdays, we talked so that every each of us would know about our cases. And, you know, not only did that give us a flexibility that we needed, but the, you know, a lot of the men then went on flex time. You know, they mm-hmm. might come in seven and get, you know, get leave early. So, you know, it really benefited the agency. And um, so, you know, th- during that time, you know, we had another child. So, you know, it, it, it's been challenging, but, you know, we, we just kind of worked it out. And, you know, then when after the, uh, the younger one went to preschool full time, then I went to work full time again. And, we just had, you know, friends, family. You know, we had a woman named Miss Cartwright who, you know, would be there available. She was a retired woman. She'd come to the house if the kids got sick. And so we just had to work all those things out because we did not have any family here in Nashville. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Now, you know, you have been active in community service, Miss Billy, for a very long time around town. You were a founding member of the Women's Professional Organization, Cable. And it's – tell me more about that group because it's still – and it's still active today, right? Yes, it's it's celebrated its 45th anniversary this year. And uh, when I graduated from law school, there began to be a critical mass of not only attorneys, but other professional women uh, in, in their various careers, you know, kind of infiltrating all kinds of businesses and uh, starting their own businesses. And, and then, uh, you know, Rotary did not accept women. Uh, there were no... Uh, the, a lot of the private clubs, you know, you'd be in a corporation or whatever, and the guys say well, they were going somewhere to lunch, and you couldn't go because they didn't accept women. Uh, so we said we needed our own old girls network, mm-hmm. and that's that's how Cable got founded. And um, so there were, you know, a number of us uh, who uh, got together, and we would meet for lunch, have, you know, outstanding speakers, network, and and, and share information. And uh, it, it still exists today. How does yes. it feel to see 45 years, you said? Yeah, 45 years. How's that feel? It feels good. You know, it feels good uh, to have been part of something that has endured and also helped a lot of people to uh, to advance their careers. You also helped WPLN in a sense. You were <laughs> on the library board. And when WPLN became an independent station, you were on the first board of directors for this station. That's correct. Uh, I, I was on the library board appointed by, well, the first mayor that appointed me was Bill Boner, but I've been appointed by, like, you know, all the mayors since then uh, for 17 years. Mm. Uh, I was on the library board, and at that time, the library owned the license for WPLN. And during that period, uh, the... Um, license was spun off as an independent organization, and I was on that first board of the independent WPLN. Well, thank you so much for your work. We're going to take one more quick break, and then when we cut, look, if it wasn't for you, I might not be here. So this is fantastic. We're going to take one more quick break, then I'm going to come back and talk to you both about the Metropolitan Interdenominational Church that you founded in 1981.
I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. My guests today are Dr. Billy Sanders and Reverend Edwin Sanders. Both have been institutions in Nashville for decades. They're the founders of the Metropolitan Interdenominational Church, and they're leaders of service for Nashvilleans and Tennesseans at large. Again, Miss Billy, Dr. Ed, thank you. Reverend Ed, thank, thank you, you so much thank for you. being here with us. Now, in 81, you both founded the Metropolitan Interdenominational Church. Reverend Ed, you know, you, you spoke earlier about the mission of your father. Um, really bringing people in, finding equality through faith, through service. You mm -hmm. talked about how it's kind of influenced every decision that you've made since those formative years. Where did the idea come from to start your very own church? I think a part of answering that question would, uh, would I guess, call me to even elaborate a little further on something we had talked about for a little bit uh, in terms of early growth and development, especially as it relates to issues of social justice and transformation and change and community organizing and all of that. One of the things that happened to me, remember I said my father died, birth father, when I was 11. When I was uh, 14, uh, we had moved back to Memphis. We had been in Arkansas for a couple of My father actually died while we were living in Arkansas. He was actually on one of his mission trips to Oklahoma, to uh, uh, a, a place that uh, was just outside of Oklahoma City, El Reno, Oklahoma. And he was leading a workshop there. The name of the place where he was, I always smile when I think about it. He was doing a workshop at a place called Devil's Canyon, mm. which was a retreat center that was actually owned by the Methodist Church. But I, I mentioned that to tell you that there are... I've got such a, people look at me all the time and, and smile and say, you know, even my son-in-law says sometimes, you know, you got to be exaggerating. You didn't know all these people along the way. But I think one of the things that happened to me is I was blessed that there were people who continued to be in my life that made a big difference. The first was my second father. I never refer to him as my stepfather. He was my second father. Mm. He came into my life when I was 14, and uh, he was a very, very firm and staunch man. He was a widow. My mother had been widowed. And uh, my father had died. His wife had died. And uh, both had children. Uh, if you put both of his families of children together, I would have been the youngest of both. I was the one who ended up being at home with him more than any other. And um, he was not one known for having a lot of flexibility. He was very straightforward and to the point in things. But at the same time that my mother remarried, and here's this man who comes into my life who was just wonderful. We had one disagreement in the whole time of his life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I always like to laugh about that one because the only disagreement I ever had with him was when I refused to go to Morehouse College. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> his sons had been to Morehouse. I mean, and I remember I decided to go all the way up to Middletown, Connecticut, to Wesleyan University. And I remember his last words to me when that argument ended. It didn't last but a couple of days. But I'm, <laughs> I, I, I will not tell you exactly how he said it, but he made it very clear. <laughs> you can be sure that I will not be the one that will be sending uh, payments to that school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they, so that they'll be ready. So that was the first thing. But then the other thing that happened to me when I was 14 years old, which I think is one of the most significant developments of my life, is that James Morris Lawson came to be my pastor mm. when I was 14 years old. And everybody in Nashville and around the world almost knows him because he's the person who Martin Luther King Jr. referred to as the architect of the nonviolent movement. And uh, so James Lawson has been my pastor since I was 14. Uh, I was 14 when he came to be my pastor. He was 33. And just a few weeks ago, the end of September, uh, I went to celebrate his 95th birthday with him. Wow. And uh, and now I'm 76. So mm -hmm. uh, it's it was, it's been interesting. There's that kind of thing. I mean, Ben Hooks, who's a legendary character for the works that he did and performed and played, lived right around the corner from me while I was growing up. Vincent Harding 
who became the head of the Institute of the Black World, who was the first person that was given the responsibility for leading the Martin Luther King Institute in Atlanta. It, it's just been a wonderful experience for me. And I could go on and on. My mentor, uh, who was, my, you know, Phil Halley, who's one of the leading uh, Holocaust scholars in, in, in the country. He's been deceased now for a number of years, but... It was just like I ended up having an opportunity yeah. to be around the right people who were able to encourage. I must admit, I was very, uh, I was very radical and rebellious at that point in my life. But um, and uh, Billy even laughs sometimes when she sees a picture of me in my setting when I was in my early twenties, and she'll say in a moment, she said, "Well." He's a great guy, but I didn't know him. <laughs> I didn't know that guy who was running around with a black beret on, a black leather jacket. And, uh, <laughs> My dad's got a couple of those photos yeah. as well. <laughs> you know, religion, faith, and spirituality, they have influenced human behavior from the yeah. very beginning of right. humanity. Right. People have accomplished great feats due to their faith. They've also caused, caused incredible calamity yeah. because yeah. of their religious beliefs. And, you know, it, it helps to shape politics and policy and notably the issue of abortion rights. Right. And, um, you know, I'm looking at how, you know, how is it this church that you all stand founded is interdenominational. You just listed a lot of the people of different uh, spiritual beliefs and religious backgrounds who helped influence you. How does not only understanding different religions and spiritual beliefs, but appreciating those beliefs? How can that help us find commonality as humans? Well, I just want to speak to you know how we became interdenominational because um, we started thinking about people we wanted to invite, invite to be founding members or people just to invite to the church and we'd name this name and they would be Baptist and this person would be Lutheran and this person would be Catholic and this person, you know, might be some other denomination. And we said, why can't we all just be together? You know, mm -hmm. we are... Uh, uh, building a church that is um, is is based on Christian principles, but uh, you know we've had a lot of Jewish people to come, Muslim people to come to worship with us. Uh, so um, you know it was it was that 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 made us become interdenominational. And then we had a couple of denominations that was, acted like they were interested in us, you know, being a part of them and being interdenominational. And we realized they really wanted us to have the doctrine of that particular denomination. So we are, we're a totally independent church. We didn't have a mother church. So it was, it was a challenge. I mean, we were start like starting a new business because we didn't have a mother church that was helping us. Mm -hmm. So it, it, um, brick so, by brick. Yeah. Brick by, yeah you all yeah. actually did. Yeah. And in that work, I mean, you're, you're bringing so many people together and you're understanding about you know, I'd like to see how these two are related. You know, Reverend Ed, Ed, your work in the AIDS community, not only statewide, citywide, but nationally and globally, you know, that was something that was very important to people I've come to find at the time here in Nashville as it was, as the AIDS epidemic was really, really wreaking havoc upon people. The, the spiritual, the faith community came, people from all over came together, you know, but now it seems like HIV and AIDS are kind of on the back burner. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about it that much. It's still very much a public health issue. Just talk to me real quick about that work. Well, we're a 42-year-old congregation. And what's happened in the last uh, few years is that we were able, and I was blessed to be able to be a part of having faith aspects of dealing with infectious disease and health issues. One of the things that I found myself uh, doing was going into faith communities to make sure that information dissemination was happening in a straightforward and honest way. Mm -hmm. It also created an opportunity uh, for me because of the fact that we were early on doing things and addressing issues that others were not willing to deal with. The stigma that was associated with, with, with HIV AIDS is something that most people were trying to steer away from. And we decided to take on those issues. 
But the HIV factor, first, the church was founded February 1, 1981. The first week of June 1981 is when the CDC first put forward the, the, the information that defined HIV as we know it. Mm-hmm. Well, the first person to die in the history of our congregation, almost two and a half years after we began, it turned out had died from one of the opportunistic diseases. Mm-hmm. I want to thank my guests, Dr. Billy Sanders and Reverend Edwin Sanders, the founders of the Metropolitan Interdenominational Church. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Magnolia McKay and Elizabeth Burton. It was directed by our senior producer, Tasha A.F. Lemon. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And the conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelon. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.